to see the, the growth we've had from, let's say, 10 years ago from about 40 members to about 700 members today has been absolutely amazing. And that's something I'm incredibly proud of because it's so diverse with so many types of Jews, you know, Ashkenazi, Sephardic, you know, more reform, more observant. And it's really, I think, quite extraordinary to have that combination of, of people working so well together. Dara Jeffries, producer of the film Light of Judah, thanks so much for joining me on Global Perspectives. Thanks for having me. I watched your film and it was really quite fascinating to see this history of a Jewish community I don't think many of us uh, are very familiar with. So I would love to, I'd love to go back in history before we get to um, all the incredible developments I know that there have been in, your, in the community there. Mm -hmm. If you can, Dara, tell us, um, tell our audience a bit about the events uh, around the Inquisition. It's 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 a period that I think many forget even took place. Yes, because people often think they usually think about the Spanish Inquisition, right? They don't really think about about um, about the Portuguese Inquisition, but it happened as well. A lot of the Jews had fled from Spain to Portugal. There had been mass killings already in you know in the 14th century or before that, and they didn't really have an edict of expulsion in Portugal until later, and that was at the request of Spain. But that, that's actually, we, we tell that in another movie, actually, a later movie where we focus on the Inquisition. But we wanted to give a little, a little picture of that because the combination of the Inquisition and this um, relationship with Spain and the expulsion of the Jews meant that the Jews didn't really have very many choices. They either converted to Christianity um, or they fled. Um, or they became, and they, the ones that converted became known as New Christians, um, or they practiced in secret. Um, and so we have these these three different um, dynamics going on at the time. I want to um, move forward because the the next era that you um, you document in this film is um, is many hundreds of years forward, where you've got a man by the name of Barros Basto who finds out himself at the age of 17 from his grandfather that he has Jewish lineage and then he converts to Judaism and and I'll let you share what happens next. Well that's right so that's the, the movie did focus uh, <clears throat> both Sephirat and Light of Judah focus a lot on his story because he is a very fascinating figure <clears throat> and a very romantic idealistic figure uh, and a heroic one as well, because he was actually a very highly decorated captain in the in the Portuguese army. In fact, uh, he was the one that actually hoisted the flag of the republic in Porto when it became a republic. Uh, so you know he was he was he was a very well known captain. But his fascination with his roots um, led him to first of all he founded the association that is today our our community our uh, the official community so it wasn't to say that there weren't jews living in porto there were they were they were actually ashkenazi there really weren't any sephardic jews um in porto because they'd all as as i just explained they'd either left or converted um and so so the ones that were there were ones that had come you know from from uh, you know during the, mostly during the 19th century um from various various places mostly from eastern europe uh, so he was almost the lone, uh, you know, well, he was a convert, obviously, because he had had to convert. And, but he was the lone Portuguese, let's say, uh, Jew. And he he convinced them that they should form a community, which which they sort of agreed to. But then he went on to this new project that they were not keen on at all, which was to go. Uh, it was called the rescue work. And his idea was to go into the mountains and, and, and try and get all of these Jews that had been in hiding. And this is the part that is the fascinating story, I think, that don't people don't know is that really a lot of these Jews that had gone into hiding during the Inquisition had gone into the mountains and had kept up certain Jewish practices for centuries. Um, and 
after a time, of course, it was no longer really Judaism. It was it's almost its own thing. It, they were called Maranos. And so it was it was called Maronism and it was their own sort of mix of religion. But he was convinced that he could bring them all back into the fold um, of Judaism if he could just, you know, go get them all. So he would go off on horseback into the mountains. It was this project that he, he managed to, to garner an enormous amount of support from not so much from the local community, but from a, a, a Portuguese uh, Marano society that was set up in England, from people in all parts of the world, including uh, the Kaduris in in, uh, in China and Hong Kong, uh, to help him build uh, what is our synagogue today that is absolutely enormous. It's the, the biggest one in the Iberian Peninsula because he was convinced that he was going to get all these people uh, to, to become Jewish and join the community. Um, ultimately, that did not happen. Right. Ultimately, it did not. But, but you know, it, again, it's, it's a fascinating piece of the history of Portugal and, and the region. And I think that it also flows to... Uh, um, South America, Latin America, eventually. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what inspired you to to produce this film? Sure. So to clarify, so I'm the vice president of the Jewish community of Porto. So in the sense that I'm a, I'm a producer, in the sense that our community was the producer of the film. Uh, and I represent them for uh, these kinds of discussions about the movie. So the, 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 the story started a little bit further back. Uh, we told, uh, uh, we had a series of films we made. Uh, the first one was actually Sefarad. Um, and the, the story behind it was we felt that the community had a lot of interesting history that a lot of people did not know. And we felt that it would be best to tell it in a beautiful way, dramatically, rather than with a documentary or as a history lesson. But, you know, having the community tell its story itself without distortion. And films are a great way uh, to teach and to reach out to the broader community. Uh, so we started with, with Sefarad, but this was actually in conjunction with um, the local uh, diocese of Porto, the Catholic Church, funnily enough, because we had uh, very good relations with them. And we decided that the best way to combat anti-Semitism and to build um, ecumenical relations and to foster good relations in the community was to work together with the with the Catholic Church. So and that's and, and that's so highly we, ironic because again the the film starts <laughs> with events around the Portuguese Inquisition. Dara, have you found that with um, with the creation of this film, with the release of the film, that you are finding interest not only from Jewish audiences but from non-Jewish audiences? Absolutely. But but I, I would say that the film we did later, the 1618, which is a broader look at the Portuguese Inquisition, is a, it has a broader appeal. I think Light of Judah, because we were trying to tell our story more specifically, uh, is is probably finds a home more amongst Jewish audiences. I, I, I think the later film, which is really just about the Inquisition in Portugal and Porto in particular, that one seems to have a broader appeal than the one that we've and then the light of Judah. <clears throat> Having said that, I must just tell you a, a small thing, which is one of the stories in the in the light of Judah, we actually turned into a short film because it was so beautiful, which is the moment um, of we called it the nuns Kaddish. And it's the moment when the nuns tell a prayer. Um, they say Kaddish. And it was such a beautiful and it's a true story. And it was such a beautiful moment that we made it into a short film. And that was extremely successful. And we actually sent it to the Pope and he wrote us the most beautiful letter. He was really touched by this film. Um, and I think it says a lot, to be honest, I think it says a lot of what we've been trying to do, which is to, to show interfaith harmony and how there can be, you know, tolerance amongst the religions, despite this horrible history, despite. And that's why it was so interesting to have those two counterpoints, right? So we have the Inquisition on one end and then you have the nuns Kaddish at the other end. And that was very important to show the progression and to show where we are today and that it, there isn't that sort of intolerance. And that was a very important message that we wanted to get across. Absolutely. And and so before we get to present day Oporto, I also want to discuss a, another period that the film covers, which is the Nazi era in Europe. And uh, and so the, the film's depiction is Jews escaping other parts of Europe and coming to Oporto for refuge, what happened during those uh, those years? You know that that's ex extremely important part of our history, and in fact, I think part of the reason that Baros Bastos 
vision in a way failed. It's not the only one, obviously, but it's partly that. Because you have to think that when he uh, inaugurated the synagogue, he inaugurated it in 1938. So we're talking about, at the, you know, right at the beginning of World War II. Uh, so it wasn't an ideal time to be uh, expanding a Jewish community. What People weren't interested. People were worried about other things. And sure enough, the synagogue became a place of refuge um, as Jews fled from um, Nazi Europe. If they could get to Portugal, it's actually portrayed in the movie Casablanca. It's like, oh, if you can just get to Lisbon, you know, Lisbon and Porto, Portugal in general, were seen at the time as a place of refuge where you could, if you could get there, then you were safe. And the idea was that they would get to Portugal and then they would, they didn't stay in Portugal, though. It was seen as a sort of transit point. Um, so they were they would get to Portugal and then they would board ships to to the Americas. That was that was the goal. Yes, I don't think today any of us could imagine the harrowing uh, situation that Jews in Europe and Nazi Europe had to go through in order to try to escape. Never mind the fact that there was no country on earth that was willing to accept them. Um, Dara, I, I also would love to talk a little bit about your own personal history. So you grew up in El Porto, is that correct? Yes, yes, that's right. So I am, I now have dual nationality, but my, my parents were American expats that moved to Portugal. They decided that's where they wanted to live. Um, and so that's where I grew up and I eventually adopted Portuguese nationality. So I'm not originally Portuguese myself. I'm, I have dual nationality, uh, but I became part of the community as a child. Um, and as a child, it was it was a very strange thing because here was this enormous synagogue, but with very few uh, members of the community. So it was it was it's a very different picture today. As, as you know. So tell us about about this coexistence that you're finding there today. So today it's it's interesting because having started off as, you know, um, Ashkenazi, really, the, the community was mostly Ashkenazi. Uh, there's been a huge influx of new members and new new citizens as well that have moved to Portugal. So now the the community has grown to to you know many hundreds, and it's it's extraordinary because you know it used to be hard to even you know get a minion all the time. It was it was possible, but it was it was it was hard. Now it's that's not a problem at all. There's just hundreds of members, and they are mostly Sephardic. Uh, so that's that's very interesting, and to the point where in 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 the synagogue, we actually had to build a second prayer room. So now there's the main hall, the main prayer room that is for the Sephardic uh, services. Um, and then there's a smaller prayer room for Ashkenazi. And, and that's only really for high holidays, like Passover or something like that. For the rest of the time, the, the community is, is intertwined. And that's something I'm incredibly proud of because it's so diverse with so many types of Jews, you know, Ashkenazi, Sephardic, you know, more reform, more observant. And it's really, I think, quite extraordinary to have that combination of, of people working so well together in, in one community. I think it's quite unique. And so, Dara, I, I want to, my final question to you is, what was the hope in producing this series of films that the Oporto community did produce? What was the hope in, uh, in sharing this story with the world? Well, I think it was, there, there were several objectives. As I said at the beginning, I mean, this was a project we did with the with the local diocese where we really wanted to show, again, tell our history from our perspective because, you know, we didn't want distortions and there's a lot of fantasy and, and people tell stories in their own way. And we wanted things to be very factual. Uh, so that was one important thing. And then because a big part of our, our role is education and outreach, uh, we have thousands and thousands of students and teachers and, and visitors every year. And so these films are shown uh, in not only worldwide, but we show them in our museums and, and, in, the, and um, in our community centers and so on. And so it was very important for us to, to have our story told the way we thought it should be told and also give that perspective of, our, of how we didn't want it to be to, too negative either against the Christian. Because the thing about, you'll see this, a little, a little snap, a little preview of 1618. If you see 1618, that shows how the, the Porto community rallied around its Jews. And that was very interesting. It really was quite protective of its Jewish community. And even to this day, Portuguese are very proud of their Jewish heritage. It's, again, a very unusual thing. You know, you'll go to somebody, they will they'll immediately tell you, oh, you know, I have Jewish ancestry. Oh, I have, you know, and that's so unique that, that they'll do that. So I think that was something we wanted to show, too, that Portugal is very unique in that way. And Porto is very unique. Um, and 
and also the story of the of the Maranos that was that was such an unusual story that people didn't know. So there were so many stories to tell, and we just felt that, that telling them in a movie was was a really good way of doing it. Well, it's it's really a, a well done series. I've seen some, not all. Look forward to seeing the rest of them. It's really wonderful, Dart, to have you with us. Thanks so much for joining me on Global Perspectives. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Thanks a lot. Michael Rothwell, a member of the board of Oporto's Jewish community, as well the director of Oporto's Holocaust Museum. Thanks so much for joining me on Global Perspectives. It's a pleasure, Ellie. Thank you for inviting me. You have a fascinating community. We'd love to hear a little bit about this history that spans um, centuries. What do you think the Jewish world broadly should know about El Porto that you think most of us don't know? I think people should know is how the Portuguese uh, Inquisition came about. Uh, As you know, the the Jews were expelled from Spain in 1492, and um, about half of them, we think, moved across the border to to Portugal. And when King Manuel uh, in the 1490s wanted to wed the daughter of the Spanish monarchs, they uh, understandably made it a condition of this marriage that he also uh, expel the Jews. And uh, his, he, what happened is this king wanted to keep the Jews, but wanted to marry well. What happened, uh, this was 1496, For only 40 years later, uh, do we actually, in 1536, do we actually have the Inquisition starting in Portugal? And uh, uh, it's established in, in a number of cities, and you have a number of out de fe in a Porto, but um, where, of course, the people are, are killed by fire. And, uh, but rapidly, the, and I, I want to emphasize this because Porto is a different city, the Inquisitorial Court, Inquisitorial Court is expelled, in fact, uh, by the city uh, from Porto and has to retreat to Évora and Coimbra and, and places further south. So, um, Porto has a special situation there, uh, where although there was an inquisition going on, the 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 townsfolk, the city, clearly supported the Jews, and this is a traditionally um, a, a, a city of, of 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 work, not a city of uh, princes or kings or or great religious uh, uh, authorities. It's a very down to earth city, and uh, uh, Porto is is justly proud of its 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 um, liberal traditions in that respect. So so that's a fascinating uh, detail that the people of Oporto actually tried in some ways to help the Jews at the time of the Inquisition. Do you see that pattern repeating later with the Nazi occupation of Europe when Jews fled to Oporto uh, when they were trying to escape the Nazis? Uh, uh, certainly uh, the, the Oporto community um Porto in general the Jewish community in particular uh did welcome and helped uh, a lot of uh Jewish refugees uh pass through the city and and our f- uh, films document this uh well and so this is one of the other uh, uh moments in uh in in Portuguese history where um your films and other um documents you've created um really track track this moment. What would you say is the most next significant moment in Oporto's history following the Holocaust? Well, following the, ho- the Holocaust, um, we, we have a very um, uh, quiet period in the Jewish community in Oporto, uh, particularly in the 70s and 80s, um, when there's no religious leader. All that begins to change and takes on a new momentum in 2015 with the new uh, national, new provisions of the Portuguese nationality law for the return of Sephardi Jews. Could you tell our audience what exactly that is and how that came about? Yes, well, uh, over an, over a period now, and I'm, I'm I, this started in in the in the 90s and in 1996, particularly when there was um, a ceremony to commemorate and symbolically revoke the edict of expulsion from 1496, 
um, there was a lot of commemorations at a national level and as uh, in, in effect a mea culpa of the Portuguese state for what had happened uh, in that formal ceremony and uh, later on um, uh, it was it was felt that that was not enough that something had to be done about what happened uh, more than uh, a ceremony and and from that the idea came and it was actually propo there was a proposal by two uh, different political parties in the Portuguese parliament to uh, uh, allow the right of return for uh, Sephardic Jews who had belonged to um, traditional Sephardic communities of Portuguese origin over the centuries. And that law was actually approved unanimously in Parliament, which was also really very important. I, I think it's an incredible um, turning point, really, for Portugal, that they worked so hard to rectify this horrible period in their history. I know that there are Jews in um, communities in Latin America that do trace back their ancestry to Portugal, and these are communities where today, unfortunately, they're feeling a, a rise of anti-Semitism, or there are events that make the, them feel insecure, generally speaking, and many have, have applied for this Portuguese um, citizenship and, and I think hope to come live there. Is that, uh, is that some of the growth that you're experiencing in your community? Uh, indeed it is, although we've had applications from about 60 different countries. Under President Recep Erdogan, uh, there is this sense of instability and perhaps fear. There have been, there's been so much tension with his relationship with Israel, a lot of really anti-Semitic statements that he's made over the years. Are you finding that the Turkish Jews are also applying for this Portuguese citizenship? Are they trying to come live in, in Porto and take refuge there? This is one of the most extraordinary features of the timing of, of the nationality law that coming as it does over 500 years after the event, by an incredible coincidence, it arrives just at a time when it was being needed by the Turkish popul Jewish population, which had felt so much uh, so at home in Turkey for all these centuries. And as you rightly point out, uh, the current political situation in Turkey is makes the Jews feel very uncomfortable. Whereas in general, the fact that somebody obtaining Portuguese nationality doesn't mean they will necessary, necessarily migrate to Portugal. Uh, there is this feel of the Jews have, they need of, of a plan B because Jews can never be sure they will be welcome in the future in the country they reside. And this feeling was particularly intense with the Turkish when the law started, so that in the first year or so of operation of the law, the Turkish uh, applicants were the majority of the ones that were received. This um, dropped down a bit later on because, in fact, the, the community is, is not that large compared with, for example, with the community in Israel. It, it, it must be truly a relief for them to know that there is perhaps uh, a possibility for them to come to your community. And so I'd love to speak a bit about Oporto today. Tell us, what, what, is, what is it like to live in Oporto? What's the demographics? What would people find surprising about, about your special community? Well, uh, to me, it, it's, it's uh, a constant uh, source of uh, amazement because uh, I've been a member of the community for decades, and um, from from the 90s, at a time where it was a very quiet community. We had trouble raising a minion for the high holy days, uh, let alone a, a Sabbath. And uh, to see the, the growth we've had from, let's say, 10 years ago from about 40 members to about 700 members today has been absolutely amazing. One of the two astonishing things about our community, not only is it growing, which itself is unusual, but we're getting lots of young members, young families, uh, students, and uh, it's, to, as I say, someone like myself has been uh, in a relatively empty synagogue just a, a few decades ago. It's a remarkable experience. Well, it sounds remarkable, and uh, and so as we our time runs out, I'd, I'd love to ask you one last question. Um, you've been working so hard on the creation of this new Holocaust Museum. What is it providing a service that you felt was necessary and the community felt was necessary that was not otherwise being served? Well, in fact, it's the first uh, Holocaust Museum in the Iberian Peninsula, uh, which is quite remarkable. 
And uh, as I say, the reason we created it in Oporto was uh, based on our archive of, of the refugees who came through Oporto. And the, the fact is that uh, in Portuguese schools, very little is taught about the Holocaust. Uh, and the result is that when people, mostly young people, thank goodness, come to visit our, our museum, it's a transformational experience for them. You can see that from the conversations we have from, with them and from the amazing messages they leave in the visitor's book. It's, they're needed everywhere because you can't take for granted uh, the further distance we get from the Holocaust, the less you can assume that young people grow up knowing what the Holocaust was really about. And so I think it's, it's, uh, has an absolutely essential role in Portuguese society today. So Michael Rothwell, thank you again for joining me on Global Perspectives. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I am so glad, though, to share this history of Oporto with you because it is a hopeful story in that centuries later we see the Portuguese government offer Jews of Portuguese descent the opportunity to regain citizenship and make this effort by the Portuguese government to correct this horrible historic wrong. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Global Perspectives. Join me the next time.